Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we will solve some data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number 212. Page number 212, the very first one is 351. Let's take a look at it. Make sure the book is in front of you so that you can, so that you can follow the work. After having watched the video, if you find it useful and if you like to work, if you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the test, you can reach me at Keshwani Prep at iCloud.com. Let's look at number, number one, the very first one. The very first one starts out by giving us an example of a sequence. It's, it goes on like this. It says, an, a sequence, a sequence such as, you see it's an example, such as 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Let's say positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. It goes on to tell us that sequence such as that has has four sign changes. It has four sign changes. For example, it goes from positive to negative, that's one sign change, negative to positive, that's another one, positive to negative, that's another one, that's a third one, negative to positive, one, and fourth one. It says a sequence such as this one has four sign changes. Now I don't know about you, but it's not it was an earth shattering news to me. Enough of that. So we know obviously what a sign change is. So here's the actual question. This is this is not the actual question. They just gave us an example in the beginning to make us understand what a sign change is. So let's look at the actual example, actual question. The question is this. It says, does, does a sequence S1, S2, S3, all the way up to Sn, have have even number of sign changes. Does this sequence, a sequence about which we know absolutely nothing, they don't tell you exact anything at all about what the terms are and how many terms are in there. We don't know how many terms there are, we don't know what the terms are. Question is, does this sequence have even number of changes, even number of sign changes, either two or a four or six, six sign changes in that sequence? Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. In the first statement, in the first statement, they tell us that the sequence is supposed to take this form: s k is supposed to be negative one raised to k. Negative one raised to k. As you can clearly see, it all depends on what the value of the k is. For example, if k happens to be if k happens to be 3, if k happens to be 3, the first one is going to be negative 1 raised to 1, negative 1 raised to 2, negative 1 raised to 3, and we'll have a negative 1, a positive 1, and a negative 1. We have two sign changes. It goes from negative to positive, positive to negative, two sign changes. But if k happens to be 4, well, let's just continue here. If, if, k, if k instead of instead of 3 happens to be 4, we'll end up having one more turn. Now, before we had two sign changes, and now we have three sign changes. How can we possibly tell? How can we possibly tell how many sign changes we'll have if we don't know if we do not know how many terms we have? No, now we know what the sequence is. Sequence is very straightforward. It starts with negative. It starts with negative one. It just goes negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, negative forever and ever. How many sign changes we'll have? Well, for that, for us to be able to tell that, we need to know how many terms there are, and that's all it is. We don't know what the value of k is. We don't know how many terms there are. So the first statement by itself is not enough. First statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement by itself is not enough, we know answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C or D. B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they tell us that N is odd. So now we know, now we know that we have odd number of terms in the sequence. 
Now, remember, we have to ignore this one completely. We do not know this at all. All we know is that we have a sequence, and they're looking for how many. They're looking to see if we have even number of sign changes or not. We know nothing about what a se actual sequence is. At this point, all we know is that we have n number of terms, or other, uh, we have odd number of terms. We have odd number of sum. For example, three, four, five, six, and seven. That's an odd number of terms. There are five terms here. But we know nothing at all, nothing at all about the sequence, nothing at all. So the, how many sign changes does it have? Well, as it stands, as it stands, it has zero sign changes. It, does, it never changes the sign. Or maybe, maybe, it ha maybe the sequence is like this. Now it has one sign change. Or maybe it's like that. Now, it's, now it is three sign changes. It goes from positive to negative, negative to positive, and then it stays positive, and then positive to negative. Now it has three sign changes. We can't really tell how many sign changes it has by simply knowing that there are odd number of terms without actually knowing the terms, without actually knowing what the sequence is made up of. But when we put the two statements together, the second statement by itself does not do the job. But if we put them together, if we put them together, now of course we can answer the question very easily. This tells us what the form is. It goes from negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, and so on and so forth. It just goes on forever. And this tells us that we have odd number of sequence, odd number of terms rather. If we have odd number of terms, here we have four. One, two, three, four. We need one more. And now, since it has odd number of terms, we can exactly, now we can tell precisely whether or not the number of sign changes is even. They're not asking us how many sign changes does this sequence have. That, that we cannot answer because we don't know how many terms there are. We just know that it has odd number of terms. So they're not asking us how many, how many sign changes it has. It, they're, ask, they're simply asking us does it have even number of sign changes and that we can answer. For example here, there's one sign change from negative to positive. There's one sign change, second sign change, third sign change, and fourth sign change. Or maybe instead of five terms, maybe it only had three terms. Maybe it has only three terms. Negative one, positive one, and negative one. Maybe it only has three change three terms, in which case we have one sign change and two sign changes. As you can see, in both cases, here we have two sign changes, here we have four sign changes. In both cases, we can answer this question, does this sequence have even number of sign changes? The answer is yes. It does have even number of sign changes. We can answer the question by putting the two together, <coughs> and therefore, the answer to this problem is C. Number two, number 352. Number 352 says, Jack picked 76 apples. They're going to tell us that he gave 4y to Adam. You give 4y to Adam, we're going to use a for Adam, and and 3t to Betty. B. And then he, they're going to tell us that he kept the rest of the apples for himself. Kept the rest for himself. For which you will use the letter J. So, so far, so, so far what we have been told here in three different sentences here can be summarized very easily, very succinctly by, uh, with a simple, simple equation. We know the total has to equal to the apples, number of apples that he gave to Adam, the number of apples he gave to Barry, and the number of apples that he kept for himself, which is the rest of them. So, so A plus B plus J has to equal 76. And A we know is 4Y. B we know is 3t, and J, we're just using J, is 76. There we go. This is what we know. Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. What, the question, what is the question asking? Oh, what's the value of J? The question is, what's the value of J? How many apples did he keep, it, keep for himself? Let's find out. Let's see what they tell us in statement 1. Statement 1 tells us that y is greater than or equal to 15. 
y is greater than or equal to 15. Let's see what we can do. We, we're going to rewrite this equation here. 76 equals to 4y plus 3d plus j equals, seven, equals 76. And the question now is, oh, and they tell us, and, and they also tell us that t equals to 2. And they also tell us that t is equal to 2. I'm going to change the marker. Let's see what we can do. I hope, I hope that you're able to see right away. You're able to see right away that this is not going to work. Simply knowing that, that y is equal to 15 is not going to work. Y is equal to fifth, y is equal to greater than or equal to 15. So it could be 4 times 15 plus 2 times t is equal to 2. So 2, 3 times 2 is 6 plus j. In which case we can figure out what the value of j is, which is going to be a unique value for j. Or maybe since y is greater than or equal to 15, maybe maybe y is maybe y is 16. As we can tell you, see, they're going to give give us two two different values for j. They're going to give us two different values for j because here is 60 and here is 64. So whatever value for j that we find here, when y equals to 15 in the second equation, the j is going to be four less than this. We can't really tell how many apples he kept for himself by simply knowing that he gave at least 15 apples, at least 15 apples. Well, actually, it's not even 15 apples. It's 4 times 15 apples to Adam. He, simply by knowing that he gave at least 4 times 15 apples. Maybe it's 4 times 15, maybe it's 4 times 16, maybe it's 4 times 17. Who knows? That, that first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. First statement doesn't do the job. Second statement goes on to tell us that uh, y is equal to 17. Oh, there you go. y is equal to 17. The problem here is that the second statement does tell us exactly what y is, but unlike the first statement where they told us that t is equal to 2, here we have no value of t. And without the value of t, we cannot figure out the j. So second statement by itself is also not enough. But when we put the two statements together, now of course we can answer the question. The answer is c. Now we can very easily figure out now we can very easily figure out how many apples Jack kept for himself because we know y is 17, we know y is 17, and t is 2. So 76 has to equal 4 times 17 plus, uh, plus 3 times 2 plus j. And we can figure out the value of j from there. What the value of j is, we really don't care. The point here is that we can figure it out. We have enough data. In other words, Putting the two statements together does the job, and therefore the answer is C. Third, that was 352. The one that we just finished was 352. 353. 353 says, what number is 6 more then x plus y. Understand that they're asking us what number is 6 more than the sum of these two numbers, which, which means which means we do not necessarily have to figure out we, we do not necessarily figure out the value of x and y individually. As long as somehow we can figure out their sum, we can ascertain whether or not we can we can figure out which number is 6 more than that sum. So we don't have to figure out x and y separately. If we can figure it out together, that's fine also. The first statement tells us that y is 3 less than x. y, y is 3 less than x. So here's x, whatever the x is, you take away 3 from here, that's y. That's y. Do you see a problem here? Can we figure out, can we answer the question, what number is 6 more than x plus y? The answer is no. Answer is no, we don't, have to, we don't have to think too much about it because we simply have one equation, we can only have one equation here, and two unknowns. We cannot solve for two unknowns with just one equation. First statement by itself is not going to be enough. Either we need two independent equations, or, or if it's just one equation, it has to be, it has to be in, such, in some form where you can figure out the sum of the x and y. Here we can figure out the difference, but not the sum. There is nothing to do here. We cannot figure out the sum from there. Let's look at the second one. It says y is twice x. 
y is is twice x. Again, the same problem. Again, same problem. There is no way. We, there is no way we can extract the sum of the two x and y these two uh, variables from here. And we cannot solve for x and y individually because we only have one equation and two unknown. We cannot solve for two unknowns with just one equation. But when we put them together, when we put them together, the answer is C. That's it. At the, in the real exam, in the real exam, this should go very fast because that's the end of the answer. That's, that's the end of the story. We have, now we have two unknowns and two independent equations. Here's one equation, here's another equation. Of course, we can solve for x and y. And once we have the value for x and y, we can answer the question what number is six more than six more than their sum. But we don't have to do it out. Okay? As far as the exam is concerned, we don't have to do it, but we're just gonna do it very quickly, just for practice. It's very simple, very straightforward. You see y is equal to 2x. Let's put it in here. Y is y is equal to 2x. That's all it is. There's nothing to it. Because y was equal to 2x. Bring the x over here. There you go. X is equal to negative 3. If x is negative 3, if x is negative 3, y must be negative 3 minus 3 from here, which is negative 6. Their sum is negative 3 and negative 6, which is negative 9. And the question is, what number is 6 more than that? The number that is 6 more than negative 9 is negative 3. But all of that was a sheer waste of time, and I hope that you won't do it in a real exam, because we don't need to answer that question. We simply have, we simply have to be able to tell whether or not we have enough information to be able to answer the question. The answer to that question was yes, we did have enough information because we had two independent equations and two unknown. Doing it out actually is not necessary. It is not necessary and you must never do it because it takes away a lot of time. Classic example of what I just said is the problem that we are about to do next. If you actually solve for the variables, it will take forever, but we do not to solve it. We simply have to understand a very simple concept. If there are three unknowns, we need three independent equations, at least three independent equations. If there are two unknowns, we need at least two independent equations. And if we have two independent equations, we can solve for the two unknowns. Very simple, very, very straightforward concept. But we don't have to actually do them out. For example, 354 is a classic, classic example of it. It says that we bought we bought five pound of regular coffee and we bought three pound of decaf for a total of 21.50 for a total of 21.50 the question simply is what are their prices. What are their prices? I'm going to get rid of this marker also. It is dying. That marker was dying. That marker was dying. That marker was moribund. It was about to go. Did we learn this word moribund in our vocabulary lessons? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Just give me one second. And if I can find it very quickly, I'll tell you. I believe we did. There you go. Day number 71. Vocab day 71. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, and I don't see why I don't see why yeah, why you wouldn't be. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GMAT vocabulary words, day 71, and watch that video. And if it doesn't pop up, put my name next to it. Kishwani, GMAT vocabulary words, day 71, watch the video, improve your vocabulary. It's very important. It's very important. So that marker was moribund. It was about to die. I got rid of it. Let's, work. Let's continue with this thing here. So very first thing first, the very first thing we need to do is set, set this thing up in a this is written in English language. Right, let's lie, write this in language of mathematics. Five pounds of regular five pounds of regular coffee. We're going to use letter R for regular coffee, and three pounds for decaf. We're going to use letter D for decaf. So R will represent the price price per pound of regular coffee. 
of, of regular coffee and we will use letter D to represent price per pound of decaf. Decaffeinated coffee. All right. So based on that, now we have it. Since we, since R is the price per pound, R is the price of one pound. Since R is the price of one pound, and we bought five pound, so it's going to be five R. And since D represents the price of one pound of decaffeinated coffee, and we bought three pounds, so it's three times D, and total has to equal twenty one fifty. Twenty one fifty. As you can see, they already gave us one equation. They already gave us one equation. We didn't even have to do anything. It is given to us. It is given to us, which means that this statement that they are about to give us, statement one and statement two, if they give us some, some more information in either of those two statements, which enables us to come up with one more independent equation, then the answer is yes. We can, ask, we can figure out what the prices are, but we're not going to actually do that. To figure out the actual prices, will require a lot of time, will require a lot of time. Let's look at what the first statement says. The first statement says that the regular, that the reg regular coffee, regular coffee is 10% off. Today, they have a sale and regular coffee is 10% off and decaf is 20% off. And as a result, and as a result, if you were to buy the same amount, we will only pay 1845. We'll only pay 1845. Let's see if we can again we don't have to do all of this thing. The, the, the time the equation that we are about to write, we don't have to do it in a real exam. You simply have to be able to tell that that is an equation. That is one equation, that is one independent equation. Here is another equation. We have two independent equations. We can figure out what the prices are. The answer to this question is first statement by itself. First statement by itself is quite enough. Answer cannot be B, C, or E. So just having that, just having done that much work, we have raised our R to 50-50 of getting it right. But we're going to continue here. Just, just oh, I should have raised this thing. Five, five, five R plus three D. Here's here's the equation from statement one. Statement one tells us that the regular is five ten percent off. Whatever the price of the regular is, a 10% loss, which means instead of paying 5R, we'll simply pay 0.9 of 5R. Whatever that amount, well, this is the regular price, R is the regular price, and we're taking 0.9 of it. This 0.9 actually is because of this thing, because it's 10% off. Plus, the decaf is 20% off, which means 0.8 times 3D. See, 0.8 times D will give us 20% price that is 20% off for decaffeinated. And as a result, now today we'll only pay eighteen dollars and forty-five cents. There you go. One equation here, another equation here. First statement by itself is enough. The answer cannot be B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement says. Five pound of regular coffee costs three dollars and fifty cents more than than three pound of decaf. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. Now remember this is this is what was given in the problem itself. So here we're going to write the equation that we're going to get from the second statement. It says five pound of regular coffee. Five pound of regular coffee is five times R because R is the price per pound of regular coffee. It costs it costs 350 more than whatever the cost of three pound of decaf. Three pound of decaf, three pound of decaf costs this much, three times D. And if we pay three dollars and fifty cents more, if we pay three dollars and fifty cents more, then instead of getting three pounds of three pounds of decaffeinated, we can get five pounds of regular coffee. Five pounds of regular coffee costs three dollars and fifty cents more than three pounds of regular. As you can see, it is an independent equation. One equation, another equation. This equation was given in the problem. 
this equation we just extracted from, from, from second statement, which means second statement by itself is also enough. The answer to this problem is D. Answer to this problem is D. That's it. As far as the exam is concerned, we are done. As a matter of fact, as far as the exam is concerned, we, will, we wouldn't even waste our time to actually write out the actual equation very neatly. Just look at it, just read it and understand it, that in there, in there lies an equation. And that is another equation. Therefore, it, second statement by itself is enough. The answer is D. From this point on, for the next couple of minutes, we're going to actually solve this equation only because something like this quite legitimately appear in the multiple choice problem. Something like this can very easily appear in the multiple choice problem and they simply ask you what are the prices. And we have to be able to figure out the prices just for practice. Purely for practice, not something we will do in the real exam in the data sufficiency problem, but purely for practice we can actually solve these equations. Very quickly, just to see what happens. Let's work, let's work with the Let's work with the second equation first. This is this came from the second statement. This came from the second statement and this was given to us in the problem itself. This was given in the problem itself. As you can see how simple it is. It's very simple. This is 5r, 5r equal that, and that's 5r. All we have to do is substitute this 5r value in that. Let's do that. We're going to replace this 5r with this thing. So 3d plus 350, that's our, that's our 5r, plus 3d equals 2150. Nothing to it. And let's solve for it. Let's solve for it. I, we're going to need this equation again when we work on that one, but that's okay. We'll rewrite it. There we go. 60, 60 equals 2150 minus 350. 2150 minus 350. So it's just 21 minus 3. 21 minus 3 is 8, 18. There you go. It's very simple. 60 is equal to 18. Which means, which means the decaffeinated, decaffeinated coffee costs three dollars per pound. It costs three dollars per pound. Once we have the, once we have the price of the decaffeinated coffee, we can very easily figure out the price of regular coffee by using either of the two equations that we just had. As you can see, it can be done. Let's rewrite, let's rewrite the equation again, the original equation that was given to us. In the problem, this was given to us. We were told, we were told that five pounds of regular coffee plus three pounds of decaffeinated coffee costs twenty-one fifty. Twenty-one fifty. Twenty-one fifty. And this is what was given in the first first statement. Let's see what we can do now. Let's see what we can do now. This was given in the first statement. Give me one second, I want to see which way I want to go. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You see there is 0.9 here. If we can multiply this entire equation by 0.9, we'll have 0.9 times 5r, 0.9 times 5r, and we can get rid of this quantity. Let's multiply this whole equation by 0.9, and if we do that, this guy becomes 0.9 times 5r plus 0.9 times 3d, and 2150, 2150, 2150 times 0.9, 2150 times 0.9, which means it is simply 2150 minus the 10%. 2150, 10% of that amount is $2.15, $2.15. As you can see, it is taking time. It is not necessary. There is no way you can do this in the real exam. So that's going to be 5, 4 minus 1 is 3, and 10 minus 2 is 8. I hope I did not make any mistake. That's another thing that you have to worry about. It's very easy to make mistakes here. And I did make a mistake because I have 345 in my thing. 2150. I get 1935 here. So that's a 5. 4 minus 1 is 3. 10 minus 2. Oh, we didn't borrow anything. We didn't borrow anything, so it's 21 minus 2 is 19. This is 1935. 1935, 1935 represents 90% of that amount. Let's write that there, 1935. And the original equation is right here. 0.9r from the first statement. 5r 
plus 0.8 and 3D equals 18.45. We are almost done. Let's subtract the second equation. Let's subtract the second equation from the first equation. So if you do that, 0.9 times 5R is going to drop out. That was the whole point. And here we have 0.9 and 0.8. So we're going to have 0.1 times 3D equals 1935 minus 1845 is simply 90 cents. It's simply 90 cents. You see that? Let's multiply the entire equation by 10. If you multiply the entire equation by 10, the point 0.1 is going to become 1. So 3D and point 0.9 is going to become 9. There you go. B equals 3, which is exactly what we found a second ago. The price per pound of decaffeinated coffee is $3. But one more time, for the last time, it was sheer stupidity for us to have done that if we did this in the real exam. It was a sheer, utter waste of time. But that is how it's done. Three, 3.55. 3.55. I kept, go kept going back and forth debating whether or not I should do this in the video because the video becomes very long when you start doing silly things like that. But then I said, why not? Okay, we are told here that A and B are integers. A and B are integers. Question is, is A raised to 5 less than 4 raised to B? That is the question. We are told that AQ is equal to 27. A is equal to negative 27. So before we solve this question, before we solve this question, I have a confession to make. I have a confession to make, and the confession is that I got when I was doing this problem on my own, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. I got it wrong because I was too arrogant, too cocky and too careless, not paying attention. I got it wrong. It is a tricky problem. It is a tricky problem. Slow down. I'm warning you. Slow down and pay attention. So what I did was, when I was doing it myself, what I did was, this is very simple. A cubed equals negative 27. Obviously, that means that A equals to negative 3. And at this point, what I said to myself is, what I said to myself is that if A equals to negative 3, we can figure out this quantity. But since we know nothing about B, since we know nothing about B, we cannot answer this question. So I need a picking. A, D, B, C, E. So when I was doing it myself, I ended up coming to the conclusion that the first thing by, by itself is not enough because I know, we know nothing about the value of B. I ended up picking C for this question. I ended up picking C for the question and that answer is wrong. That answer is wrong. Let's do it properly, shall we? So pay attention. So we know a is equal to negative 3. Okay, pay attention, I already said it. a equals to negative 3. We don't need any of this thing. So I'm going to erase all of this thing. We don't need it. We already have it from first statement that a equals negative 3. Let's put it in here. Let's put it in here. So we have negative 3 raised to 5. Negative 3 raised to 5. Question is, is this quantity less than 4 raised to b? That is the question. Without knowing anything at all about b. So here's what, here's what I missed. Negative 3 raised to 5, negative 3 raised to 5, I hope you are able to see a negative number raised to an odd power is a negative quantity. It's a negative number. Whatever this quantity is, is less than 0. You understand that? Now let's go here. 4 raised to b, so we already know this quantity is negative. 4 raised to b, what I did not understand, what, did not, what I did not uh, bother to analyze in my haste, in my arrogance, in my cockiness, is, that, is the fact that it doesn't matter what B is. It makes no difference what the B is. For example, if B happens to be negative, B happens to be negative 2, it's just 1 over 16, it's positive, it's more than 0. If B happens to be 0, we know B is an integer, we tell us B is 0, so maybe B is 0. In which case it is equal to 1, it is positive. If B happens to be positive, then of course it's positive. 
So it doesn't matter whether b, we do not we do not need to know anything at all about b, whether b is we know it's an integer, we know it's a we know it's an integer, we don't know whether it's a negative integer or whether it's just a zero or it's a positive integer, but it doesn't matter in all cases this quantity will always be positive. This quantity will always be positive and this quantity will always be negative. So can we answer this question now? Is this quantity less than that? Of course it is. The answer is yes, it is. We, we are able to answer the question and therefore the first statement by itself does the job. Answer cannot be B, C or E. It will have to be either A or D depending on what they tell us in the second statement. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, in the second statement, they tell us, oh there you go, in the second statement they tell us that b squared is 16. So pay attention again, b squared is 16. If b squared is 16, that tells us that b is either a positive 4 or a negative 4. Is a positive 4 or negative 4, but that by itself is not enough for us to determine whether or not what this is. For example, for example, if a happens to be, if a happens to be 1, and b happens to be either positive 4 or negative 4. Let's look at this scenario. If a happens to be 1 and b happens to be positive 4 or negative 4, let's, let's look at this one. So a raised to 5, which simply means if a is equal to 1, if a is equal to 1, which means 1 raised to 5 versus 4 is to, if it's positive 4, 4 is to positive 4, or if it's negative 4, it's going to be 4 is to negative 4. As you can clearly see, as you can clearly see that 4 is to negative 4 is 1 over 164. This is 1. In this case, 1 is bigger than this quantity. And in this case, 1 is less than that quantity. We don't even have to worry too much about changing the value of a. We can just fix the value of a whatever you like. The fact that b can be either positive or negative, it does not tell us which quantity is bigger. It, we, are, we are unable to tell which quantity is bigger a to the fifth or 4 to the b. Therefore the correct answer to this question is a. Only the first statement by itself is enough. That was what's given there for, to fool idiots like myself in thinking that now we know b we can answer the question. Which is why I picked c for the answer. Number 356. Number 356, the very last one on the page, I believe. Yes, it is very last one on the page. It says each side of a parallelogram has length 1. So essentially, it's a square that has been squished. It's not, in 90, it's not setting at 90 degrees, but all four sides are equal. All four sides are equal, and each side is equal to 1. Each side is equal to 1. So 1, 1, 1, 1, that's what they tell us. The question simply is, what's this area? Let's go. Let's see what they tell us. Let's see what is given to us. The first statement tells us that one angle, one angle equals 45. Now, before we look into that part, the question is what is this area? For this area, we need two things. For this area, we need two, bit, two bits of information. We need to know what, how long the base is, which we know is 1, and we need to know how long the height is. If we can figure out the height, we can, we can answer this question, how long is the area? Area is simply base times height. We know the base, let's see if we can figure out the height. Based on the fact that one of the angles is 45. They don't tell us which angle is 45. So if this angle is 45, okay, listen carefully. If this angle is 45, since we are dropping a perpendicular, this has to be 90 because we dropped a perpendicular. If we drop a perpendicular and that is 45, then this would have to be 45. Let's call this distance the height, let's call it h. If this side from here to here is h, then this part from here to here is also h. Let's erase this one so it doesn't confuse us. And now we can clearly see we can figure out the height. We can, once we figure out the height, we know the base, 
we know the we can figure out the height. The first statement by itself is enough. A D B C E. The first statement by itself is enough. The answer cannot be B C or E. Now again, in the real exam we will not do it, but here very quickly just for learning, it's very quick. So it's going to be h squared plus h squared equals the hypotenuse squared, which is 1 squared. So 2h squared is equal to 1, h squared is equal to half, and therefore h is going to be 1 over root 2. And therefore the area of this thing is also 1 over root 2 because it's 1 over root 2 times 1. Base times, uh, base times high, base is just 1. So there you go. We can figure out the area very easily. First statement by itself is quite enough. Let's see what the second statement tell us, tells us. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that the altitude altitude is root 2 over 2. But there you go. Altitude is root 2 over 2. Altitude is the height. The height, they tell us, is height is root 2 over 2, which is precisely what we found here. This quantity is same as this quantity, obviously. They're not going to, they're not going to contradict each other. Again, once we have the height, we can figure out the area because the area is the height because it's height times one, which means second statement by itself is also enough. The answer to this problem is D. Answer to this particular problem is D. That was the end of that page. We'll stop right here. I'll see you tomorrow where we'll do some multiple choice problems from where we left off yesterday. If you wish to get hold of me, you can send me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com as I said in the beginning of the video. Alright, bye now.